Good afternoon and welcome to the post-COVID-19 Business Recovery in Mexico webinar, brought to you by Business West and Midlands Engine. My name is Mark and I work for the international team here at Business West. Before we start today's webinar, here are some housekeeping points. If you're having any technical difficulties, please type them into the chat function at the bottom of your screen and we'll endeavour to help. If you have any questions, we have allowed time at the end, so please type them into the Q&A tab, which you will find at the bottom of your screen. We will then read these out at the end. If you'd like to ask a question but would not like to be named, please message your events team privately and we will read this out. We will try our best to get through all the questions, but those we are unable to answer, we will follow up with an advisor will be in touch. And finally, please note this webinar will be recorded. I'm now pleased to introduce my colleague, Sarah Hildersley from Business West and the Department for International Trade, Southwest. Thank you and over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you everybody for joining us today and welcome to this webinar from, from Business West. As, as Mark mentioned, um, we're working today in partnership with Midlands Engine, um, with DIT Mexico and colleagues from the Mexico UK Business Council. And we're delighted to be joined today by John Wright from Lawbiz Consultancy and colleagues from Sanchez Giovanni, um, Eduardo Sotelo, and Andres Gámez, um, and our colleague Diana Leon from DIT Mexico as well later on. Um, and all my colleagues today, thank you very much for, for, for speaking today. Just a bit of my background is um, I'm a market specialist on Latin America, based here in the southwest of England. And for the last three years or so, I've been helping companies right around the region to access the region, to understand the opportunities in Latin America. And until a few years ago, I was based in, in Mexico as deputy head of what is now DIT's team in Mexico. And a few years before that, had a political role in, in Mexico City. So Mexico is obviously a passion of mine. Um, Mexico went into lockdown under COVID-19 around about the same time as the UK. And in a similar fashion to the UK, businesses starting to recover, starting to be opened up. And uh, for that reason, we thought it was a good opportunity to take a look at the market, take a look at the, the opportunities in light of what's happened through COVID-19, assess what changes there may have been to the business environment in Mexico, and just update everybody on the, on the various opportunities that we see uh, as being live and relevant to, to British companies in, in Mexico. Um, from the southwest, um, Mexico has not traditionally been a huge market. We're talking sort of tens of millions of pounds in the last year or so. But there has been a rise of 8% in trade with the region. And that's mostly in areas of engineering, advanced manufacturing, and some technologies. There are examples of companies from the southwest, such as Ranishaw, who have good presence in Mexico with, with offices uh, that have been operating there for some years now uh, with some success. Renishaw is a good example of a company that's got fantastic bang up to date technology, which is used to deploy in Mexico to great effect, working with a range of Mexican industry. And um, the example that it sets through uh, delivering into the supply chains, into Mexican industry, uh, to enable Mexican industry to, to gear up and produce as much as it does is a really fantastic relationship that many British companies have in place there. Um, the all important neighbor to the north, the US, is, is of course fundamental to Mexico's trade. And through the US-Mexico-Canada agreement, which uh, comes to, into effect in July this year, there will be developments that we wanted to study as well, which will help British companies, I hope, understand the, the big opportunities that, will, that also presents. So um, I'd like to, next slide please, just to take a very quick look at the agenda today. Um, uh, my colleague Andy Smith is just going to touch on um, some of the services and support that DIT provide in, in the UK. John's going to cover the trading environment in Mexico as it stands and the sort of key sectors of, of um, potential for British company in the market. 
Eduardo Sotelo is going to look at supply chain developments, and that will help to uh, illustrate the opportunities that we see for British companies as, a, as they relate to um, the Mexican economy right now. Uh, and also he will touch on the US-Mexico-Canada agreement to give a bit more information about how that, that supports um, trade with the market. Diana Leon is uh, the head of the infrastructure team and uh, as, as such she's going to give us a really good insight into developments in the infrastructure sector in Mexico and an update on the big projects, the big ticket projects that uh, the Mexican government are very keen to gear up on uh, to deliver economic recovery to the Mexican market and that in itself will present some really interesting opportunities for British companies as well. So I just want to check if my colleague Andy Smith is uh, is online. Okay, we'd like to move to the next slide then, please. Thanks very much. We're just waiting for Andy to to join the webinar, but while, while we're waiting for Andy to join, I just want to cover just briefly, um, some of you will know already that the Department for International Trade is the British government's um, uh, lead on, on international trade development, and um, we're basically here to help SMEs uh, support they're exporting into various markets overseas, but also at the moment through the COVID-19 situation, um, we're closely supporting businesses as they sort of cope with the, the impact of COVID-19 in the UK. That has meant delivering all kinds of, uh, of support in terms of connecting companies with government uh, lo loans and various support programmes to help furloughing and that sort of thing. We're just going to um, move on past Andy's slides and move to the first presentation from our guest speaker while we're waiting for Andy to join us so we have Andy uh, in the room now so please pass oh, on excellent Andy. great okay so thanks very much team I'd like to just hand, you, hand over to Andy Smith then from the Midlands Engine to touch on the support that DIT provides in the UK over to you Andy thanks very much Sarah and apologies uh, for my late arrival technical gremlins um, so uh, yeah as um, Sarah said, if we could have the next slide, please. Uh, my name's Andy Smith. I work for uh, DIT in the West Midlands region, part of the broader Midlands engine um, that covers the area from the Welsh border across to the North Sea. Uh, and a very warm welcome to you all on behalf of Midlands engine. Uh, delighted to be working with Business West, DIT Southwest on this uh, initiative. Um, so briefly, if you're not familiar with Department for International Trade, um, we're a, a fully fledged government ministry um, set up after the um, Brexit referendum in 2016 and uniting a number of previously separate government agencies. So it were the inheritor of UK trade and investment if, uh, if some of you worked with us in those days. We have four main functions, um, export support, which is uh, our principal interest today. So supporting, uh, British companies exporting to any any other parts of the world. Inward investment, uh, that's separate uh, teams who, who, who support that, but our colleagues overseas often are double-hatted and support both UK exporters to that market and sometimes inward investors from that market to the UK. Trade policy, that's a busy area at the moment with the uh, EU exit. Um, in, in train as it were so that includes teams for example who work on continuity agreements to try and ensure that the UK will continue to enjoy free trade access to markets that the EU has uh, free trade agreements with so for example South Korea uh, and Switzerland are a couple of markets that we have um, continuity agreements with so whatever happens uh, in terms of the transition period at the end of this calendar year we should, if you are exporting to those two markets, you should be able to continue pretty much as before. Uh, and there are a whole number of other markets that uh, that um, agreement is in place for. And we're currently um, prioritizing the US and uh, Japan, for example, in that kind of work. And then finally, promotion of the UK. Um, you may well have seen uh, exporting is great or business is great or uh, that kind of um, promotional material that's all part of the great campaign to uh, sort of rebrand global Britain if 
I could have the next slide, please. Um, so there are teams in uh, each of the um, nine, eight or nine English regions. Uh, so Sarah works for Business West, I work for the West Midlands Chambers of Commerce, but we in our respective regions have the export support contract for the Department of International Trade. And uh, there are common services nationwide. If you're not already working with um, an international trade advisor or with DIT, then if you, uh, when you get the slides after the uh, webinar today, if you click on that link at the bottom of this slide, it'll take you to a page on gov.uk where you can um, find your local or your regional DIT team and then through them you'd be introduced to an international trade advisor. So just a, an idea of some of the things we can help you with. So market research and finding contacts uh, in some ways today is a classic example. So we're going to be hearing from our colleagues in uh, Mexico presently and um, we have teams in uh, over 107 markets and in some larger markets like the US in many places within that market and I think in three locations in Mexico for example. So um, we can introduce you to our teams overseas, to business uh, overseas business networks, partners that we work with, Chambers of Commerce, British business groups in various countries and indeed commercial partners. We have specialist advisors. Um, in our region for example we've got a, a colleague who um, runs masterclasses and is an expert on international communication and business culture um, who can help you avoid faux pas which you know could be using the wrong color on your marketing material or using an image that people might find offensive in their particular cultural context so um, worth plugging into that support um, also specialist advice on uh, more complex markets and uh, IP protection um, a large part of my day job is organizing events and webinars such as this one and, and trying to put you as exporters or would-be exporters in front of either buyers or um, people in the market who can help you access buyers and, and, and expand your business. And then we have a whole suite of uh, digital um, tools and support. Um, those links on the right take you to a number of those. Uh, one will help you get uh, to uh, an overseas trade show once they're uh, up and running again um, and subsidize you to do that to be able to exhibit there. Um, there are live export opportunities that you can view and, and filter by market and sector um, and we've got um, ways in which you can put your own profile on there so it's a free uh, shop window effectively for your product or service and then finally there are a whole number of um, e-commerce marketplaces where DITs negotiate at slightly discounted rates, for example, and you can access those through that link. And if we could move on to the final slide for me, please. Thank you. So this is just a quick one. Um, so there are teams in uh, all the English regions and sister organisations in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, and we have a headquarters in London, which is uh, where a lot of the policy and sector specialists are based and then all the ministerial support people and so on. And then um, what some would say, the jewel in our crown, our overseas network, as I said, uh, well over uh, 107 um, countries and uh, Latin America and the Caribbean I've put top of the list uh, for today. Um, we've got teams in um, the majority of markets in that region um, and they're headed up by Her Majesty's Trade Commissioner, Joe Krellin. Um, who's based in Brazil, but uh, more, more on Mexico specifically uh, to follow. And they are, as I say, individuals dedicated to supporting you in uh, selling your wares or helping you set up in that market if you want to. And I think that's uh, enough from me. Um, actually, very briefly, Midlands own exports to Mexico, to be honest, relatively modest, um, about 16 million last year. And the strongest sectors for us were automotive and food and drink. Um, and I think the biggest wins were for companies who've actually set up operations in, in Mexico, sort of subsidiaries of UK players. But um, we recognise it's a very big player in the Latin American context and we're delighted to be part of today's webinar and looking forward to it. Thank you, Sarah. Back to you. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Andy. Excellent. So I'm going to hand over now to John Wright from Lobbyist Consultancy. He's going to cover the trading environment and key sectors of opportunity in Mexico. Over to you, John. Thanks. 
Well, welcome everybody, and a big thank you to Sarah and the team, both for the invitation here and for facilitating the webinar. Um, this will take around 15 minutes, so we'll, I will touch on one or two things, but obviously there won't be too much depth here, so um, don't expect that. My name is John Wright. I represent the Lawbiz Consulting Group here in the UK. Our head office is in Mexico City, and we have offices in Mexico and uh, some other Latin American countries local to that. We are a legal accounting and business consultancy group. So I'm also tasked with picking some subjects that are relevant to the title and that also I think are going to inspire and interest you. So I'm no stranger to DIT uh, seminars. So I've kind of reflected on the sort of questions that I see asked there and the conversations I've had with British SMEs, both as customers and uh, people at DIT seminars. So I hope what I've managed to extract from that you find uh, relevant to your own interest. So good, could we have the first slide please? So let's talk about uh, Brexit and COVID. Oh, to be back in 2015 before the world fell in on us. Um, Brexit, as we know, uh, Boris Johnson has told us there will be no extension. So at least by the end of this year, we should have some clarity for good, bad or indifferent. The trading arrangements with Mexico and the UK at the moment are that we enjoy a free trade deal with Mexico under the agreement brokered by the EU. Um, the intention on both sides of the Atlantic at the moment is to replace that with something that uh, replicates it. Uh, nothing is yet signed and sealed, but in the medium to longer term, things are expected to be smooth and pretty much as they are, but watch this space. I know from conversations with the DIT that Mexico has been identified as a key trading partner post Brexit, in fact, in the top five. Um, and one truism, I know we all know this, but sometimes it does, uh, does some good to focus on things, is that this crisis will end, of course. Next slide, please. Um, the world will move on. So why do we think that now might be a good time to look at Mexico? Well, our experience of the world at the moment is companies are doing one of three things. Some sadly will not survive. Others are sitting there waiting for the storm to pass and yet others are creating their future by seeking out opportunities. And I imagine people like yourselves who are tuning in today are ambitious for the future and are thinking, where are they going to be post Brexit? So happily, we're all sitting in box three. We all have, or most of us have more time on our hands than normally we enjoy. Uh, and it is clear that activity and results are far apart. One has to start and enjoy the benefits some time down the line. So the argument is clear, why not use the time we have and uh, to inspire ourselves and think about moving forwards. And if I can quote uh, Intercam Banco in Mexico, all economies will shrink or are shrinking, but the underlying economies, are, sorry, the underlying financial systems are sound. In other words, the world will emerge from this, perhaps economically battered and bruised, but we will move forwards and hopefully soon Next slide, please. So this is another uh, analysis. COVID will change the world as we know it. Uh, this is an analysis again from Intercam. And uh, it looks at the winners and losers, what the changes will do to uh, affect different market areas. There's been a lot of talk about the low touch economy, which is quite a nice phrase to really summarize the way we're going to have to think post COVID. So the winners identified here, this is a view from Mexico, but I think it applies really anywhere. Uh, telecommunications, e-commerce, I guess we would all recognize that, pharmaceutical supermarkets, food and beverages look like they might benefit or at least emerge relatively unbruised. Banking, real estate and automotive, perhaps banking may um, see a push more to digital, particularly in uh, 
countries with low take up of digital use of banking. And sadly, there will be some that will take long time to recover or maybe uh, will not ever really achieve the uh, levels of business that they enjoyed pre-crisis. Uh, anything to do with discretionary travel, I guess, things like aviation hotels and enter entertainment, discretionary consumption, high street retail, these are all areas of industry that are likely to suffer in the longer term. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little about uh, Mexico, uh, the economic and trading environment. So the elephant in the room, well, to describe that, let me give you an anecdote. I was at a conference a little while ago where there was an English gentleman uh, who had long experience of me the Mexican market, having lived there for some time. And he asked, what are the first things that you think of when you think of Mexico? And Sadly, and perhaps somewhat predictably, up came drug, drug trafficking and violence and the nastier side of the world. Um, his response to this was, I think, balanced. And it was that when you enter a market, uh, you take the same precautions in Mexico as you would anywhere else where you're not sure. Any market in the world has problems and it has issues. But Mexico is very clear that the rule of law is respected, contract law is upheld. Uh, and I think uh, it would be a shame if headlines like this were to put anybody off who had a serious interest in the Mexican market. It is a huge economy with 126 million people, uh, double the size of this country. Um, it is the 15th largest in the world and predicted to be the eighth by 2050. Uh, imagine the uh, growth trajectory there, of course, that's enormous. It's geographically, strategically placed. Let me sidestep, if I may, for a moment, just to indicate, uh, to demonstrate this. I had the pleasure earlier this week of a conversation with Eduardo Garcia, who is the president of the board of Intercam Bank. And I said, I will be presenting to uh, British companies interested in the Mexican market give me one or two things uh, from his point of view that, that may be of interest. Well, he mentioned that the macro economy has been well managed over the years, uh, that inflation is relatively low, that the central bank is independent. But the thing that really made me sit up and think was when he said that Mexico is a global economic superpower. Well, I'd never seen it like that. But let me put it into the context of what he really meant. And he was talking about, of course, the new trade agreement that Sarah referenced a moment ago with the United States and Canada. In fact, uh, this North America becomes one enormous free trade trading block. Mexico is young, it is educated. The average age is a mere 27 and the literacy rate is over 97%. Could I have the next slide, please? So this graphically demonstrates the point, and there are a couple of things to mention here, really, which is that there is a, a rapidly growing domestic market in Mexico, and there is also a rapidly growing workforce, predicted to be 80 million people within a few years' time. Uh, next slide, please. Couple more points here. Uh, the trade with the US is $50 billion every month, wow. Uh, and another point that I picked up from Mexico, not my original thinking, but that post COVID, the US is predicted to have a 4.5% economic deficit. And they will be looking to Mexico to, uh, well, partly to Mexico, at least to start to fill that gap. And Mexico is an open economy with 12 free trade agreements covering 44 countries. Uh, and this covers 60% of global GDP. Could I have the next slide, please? Right, commercial protection. This comes closer to our world. And um, the reason I wanted to put some focus on this is that when uh, we get a shiny new distribution deal, the, the little details, the legal, legalities and other um, points of interest are not really front of mind. So 
the first question there, anybody of any of you who have dealt in overseas markets will be very familiar. Distributor, partner, or your own operation is an early decision that one has to deal with. And hands up anybody that's been presented with an equitable contract first time round. That's rarely the case, and things need to be brought back to a point of fairness. And in Mexico, of course, this is in, a, in a, the Spanish language and governed under Mexican law. Is your product ready to sell in Mexico? Understanding the NOM system, Norma Oficial Mexicana. So think CE, think health and safety. It's the Mexican government's uh, duty to its citizens to protect them against uh, uh, unsuitable products and the same protections that we enjoy in Europe through CE or similar. And the extract I show here is from uh, that document and this refers to alcoholic drinks. So everything is reg regulated, but if I can give another anecdote to uh, demonstrate this point, um, I came across a uh, manufacturer, British manufacturer of soap, and he was lucky enough to find a distributor in, in Mexico. So he filled up uh, a US warehouse, shipped to Mexico, and then off out into the market, never received a second order. The relationship hadn't been helped by lack of language skills on both sides, uh, but eventually it transpired that um, he had not been aware of the NOM system. The products were withdrawn from the market and of course, needless to say, the relationship was soured. Um, and in fact, the problem really at the end of the day was just the lack of a, a bit of wording on a label. But what a shame, but it demonstrates why we have Mexican legal expertise in the UK to address these little bits and pieces up front. Um, next slide, please. So brands, trading name searches, patents, intellectual property. Again, these are at the beginning of a relationship or a incursion into a new market, small matters, but once your brand or trading name comes to have big value in a market, they become very important, both from the point of view of knowing whether you are infringing somebody else's rights and also for prote protecting your own rights and particularly the value that you may have picked up by developing the business in the market. So you can search in Mexico. I put the link there for anybody that would like to do that. And you can also register online if you are a Mexican citizen. It's a similar process to the one we, uh, we use here, um, but I would argue that it really should uh, warrant some attention at an early stage. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, opportunities for UK companies. So um, there's no possibility to go into any detail here. I'm sure we all understand that. So my point is just to try and uh, pick up one or two things and give you a view of the opportunities. The slide on the left, I put that here because it shows you the uh, imports into Mexico by business category. To point out the size, it's many billions of dollars and also the breadth of categories. Um, on the right hand side, we have high potential areas and key sectors. Auto tops both lists. This is uh, uh, partly to do with the uh, access to the US market. In our own world, we act for people like Cadillac and Honda and names like that. But I'm sure all the large international brands have operations in that market. There are other clear areas here that I'm sure you're reading while I'm talking. The, one I, the only one I'd really like to uh, mention on the way through are renewables. The Mexican government has a commitment to renewals, but what we're told is that um, they are taking this in small and careful steps because they wish to ensure that the, uh, uh, the energy generation is 24 seven, which demands that the backup systems have been put carefully in place uh, along the way. So there is a strong commitment if that's an area of the market that interests you, um, but it is being done carefully and slowly. And my final slide, or sorry, penultimate slide, please. So another area is the infrastructure. I know Diana is going to say more about this, but if I could just 
give you a quick overview. So the Mexican government is committed to increasing spending on infrastructure. And there are three levels of government in Mexico, federal, state and municipal. There are 32 states and almost two and a half thousand municipalities and they all have different needs and programs. And you can see on the right hand side, the map shows that the geographic spread is fairly even. So um, from taking a look last week, I can see that there are 325 projects currently underway and 223 new projects for which bidders and suppliers are currently being sought. Topping that list is hydrocarbons, oil and gas, of course, electricity, transport, water and the environment and the social infrastructure, real estate and tourism. So a very large breadth of opportunities. OK, thank you for that. If I could just finish on my last slide, please. So thank you very much for listening. I hope there's been something that's inspired you and I hope my information has been on topic and to the point for you. My details are here and I know that they will be sent out. If there's anything you wish to pursue after the presentation, I'm very more than happy to speak to anybody. Thank you for listening. Fantastic. Thank you very much, John. Uh, it's John Wright from Law Biz Consulting. And um, thanks ever so much. That was fantastic information covering quite a wide range of the opportunities in, in Mexico and illustrating just the size and scale of what is a, a fantastic market and an opportunity for British companies. Some really useful tips there. So thanks, John. So I'd now like to hand over to our colleagues from Sanchez Devani. Eduardo Sotelo is a Customs and Foreign Trade Specialist with Sanchez Devani. Uh, it's a law firm, big law firm in, in Mexico. We work very closely with them. They've supported a good number of British companies in recent years. So Eduardo, if I could hand over to you, please. Yes, of course. Uh... Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, uh, Mark. And uh, thank you, all the audience, for being here and, and give us a little of your time. Uh, yeah, please, uh, I mean, uh, send some chat if you're not hearing me correctly, but I will try to do my best so you can hear me well. As, as Sarah Kendi mentioned, I mean, we are a law firm uh, uh, with, with multiple areas. I mean, most of it uh, in the legal field. So, so basically, we are a one-stop shop in, in the Mexican market. When, when, when foreign investment is, is, is landing in Mexico. So we are used basically to, to incorporate entities of any kind of industries and, and, and make them, I mean, uh, uh, operative with respect to their operation they are desiring. So can you go to the next slide, please? Here, here, here with me uh, in the, in the uh, webinars as well, my partner, Francisco Andres Gámez, who is uh, an expert on the corporate uh, uh, practice group within the firm. As Sara mentioned, I mean, I'm uh, focused on foreign trade and customs and matters issues, and, and, and I will try to give you uh, certain useful information so you can value uh, the same whenever you plan to, to I mean, uh, uh, to incorporate or, or, or uh, decide to emerge, I mean, uh, to the Mexican market. Uh, so the first slide basically comprises main economic activities in Mexico and uh, we have listed some of uh, the ones that we believe are, are the most important uh, or the main ones. Automotive industry, as I mean, John uh, clearly pointed out, I mean, it's, it's one of the top uh, economic activities here in Mexico. Now, I mean, severely impacted uh, by COVID-19. Uh, but I will uh, give you further information that will be interesting uh, uh, for you uh, with respect to the, I mean, USMCA, which will be entering to force in July 1st. Uh, electronics manufacturing, I mean, the northern part of uh, the country, it's really focused on electronics. I mean, if you go to Tijuana, which is really, really close to San Diego, California, uh, you will see that, uh, I mean, LG, Samsung, and uh, many other, I mean, companies such as those ones are located, they're building electronics. Uh, fuel industries is certainly one of uh, the, the, the most important ones. Agriculture, I mean, uh, agriculture has been uh, a, a very, very uh, important activity. Uh, we have seen, I mean, uh, certain investment funds, I mean, investing in, the, uh, uh, in, in, in agriculture here in Mexico, which could be interesting as, interesting as well uh, uh, for you. For instance, we have the, the first uh, uh, or the most important producer of broccoli here in Mexico. And, 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 and basically it's the most important one 
because it produces or, 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 or I mean, it produces the, the broccoli for the, the, the top notch uh, company selling broccoli in the US. Tourism, it's a very important activity, as you may be aware. I mean, we have uh, a certain important uh, uh, places such as Cancun uh, and, and, and Cabo San Lucas, which is which are, are really, really uh, uh, attractive for, for tourists and mining as well. I mean, we have that activity uh, as a very relevant one. Aerospace industry has become uh, an activity that has grown uh, in the in the center of the country, we, in the Bajio region, which is Querétaro. Uh, many, many Japanese companies and, and US companies have established there. Uh, can you go please uh, to the next slide? Uh, here, here you will see uh, a big or a huge reference of uh, the, the free trade agreements we, we, I mean, as a country have signed with, with other countries. As, as John uh, clearly pointed out, I mean, we, we have a, a pretty open market economy. So we, we have preferential access to 46 countries. I mean, and, and why so much? Because obviously we are including here the countries comprising the European Union. But for instance, I mean, we have a very, very special uh, free trade agreement and, 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 and some uh, important activity, as I mentioned uh, before, with Japan. Uh, we have a lot of Japanese companies here in Mexico. We, we as a law firm, we have a Japanese desk uh, due to this importance. And, and based on that, I mean, I want to highlight this treaty. Also, I mean, we have the, the CPTPP, which is uh, 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 a comprehensive Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, Agreement, which entered into force in 2018. Uh, the, the, there's uh, uh, Japan as well, Singapore, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Vietnam, Argentina, and, and other countries. Uh, uh, I, I have been asked a lot of times, I mean, by Chinese investment that is currently arriving to the country, if we are planning to, to, to execute a free trade agreement with China, I don't see that as a possibility for now, considering that uh, under a USMCA negotiation, it, it was also established that uh, in the event that Mexico decides to enter into a free trade agreement with a non-market economy such as China, then basically we have to give notice to the US in order to break basically USMCA. So I don't see that as a possibility. And uh, the, the special invite uh, for, the, for the day will be, uh, or, or not in your case, uh, it will be USMCA. Uh, USMCA, as you may know, uh, we, we were threatened by the US government since uh, President Trump, uh, 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 I mean, won elections and, and, and become the president, became the president sorry, of the US. Uh, we were threatened by him to terminate NAFTA, which was uh, a huge impact to us. Uh, and, and in that sense, I mean, uh, uh, markets were crazy because uh, of this possibility. Uh, fortunately, I mean, we have uh, navigated this situation really well. And, uh, and, and, and this treaty is entering into force on July 1st, uh, a couple of days uh, 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 before the entering into force. So if you have a, an investment already in Mexico, you, you need to be prepared. Actually, I mean, the Mexican government published yesterday uh, the, the, the uniform regulations that regulate basically or clarify uh, certain uh, details with respect to, 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 to to USMCA uh, provisions such as the automotive industry. I mean, you, you know, and you have heard probably in the news that the rules of origin uh, to qualify, uh, I mean, for a vehicle to qualify as originating in the region have suffered many changes. And, and therefore, I mean, these regulations specify or clarify certain concerns. Uh, also, I mean, uh, uh, during the April, during the end of April, I mean, the, the Ministry of Economy here in Mexico ended negotiations of, uh, of a renegotiated uh, treaty with the European Union. So that's good as well. And uh, basically uh, this will give you, as I mentioned, I mean, a huge perspective of the market economy uh, that we have the free trade that we have with, with uh, most of these uh, countries. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, here here we, we, we tried to, to, to put some uh, uh, some, I mean, facts with respect to, to, to the commerce that we uh, had uh, with respect to, to, to the USMCA or, or with respect to, 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 the, to NAFTA. I mean, 61 uh, um, million of million dollars and, and with respect to Mexican commerce and exports, I mean, you have all the data there. It's a huge, huge uh, market uh, uh, with respect to the three countries. So uh, uh, we, we, we 
key aspects of TMEC, which is USMCA, uh, it's the same. I mean, in Mexico, we call it TMEC. In, in, in the US, it's called, and in Canada, the USMCA. Uh, second exporter worldwide, $2.5 billion. Second global economy, $25.9 trillion, uh, et cetera. The main products exported uh, uh, to the USMCA or, or, or within the region, automobiles, computers, auto parts, vehicles to transport merchandise, insulated conductors for electricity, Main products imported from TMEC or USMCA, petroleum, petroleum oils, auto parts, petroleum gas, diesel, or semi-diesel engines, automobiles. Can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, what's new? I mean, uh, probably you have heard uh, that uh, the treaty was modified completely. I mean, we as an experts of, of, of the matter, I mean, we have reviewed it carefully. If there are certain technical details that I will not enter right now, uh, uh, during this webinar because probably it's really technical for you, but uh, there are stricter, stricter rules of origin uh, for certain industries, such as the steel industry. Um, the steel industry is subject to many changes uh, due to the fact that uh, in the past, I mean, we have seen Chinese and, 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 North, and, and Korean uh, steel uh, uh, being imported uh, uh, to Mexico. So basically U.S. put a lot of uh, effort to basically regulate and change uh, the rules with respect to, 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 to qualifying steel uh, uh, used in the, in the manufacturing products. Uh, also, we have uh, different other chapters that were not part of NAFTA, such as digital commerce, which uh, currently obviously has, uh, uh, has become really, really relevant. Uh, we did, didn't have any provisions in that respect with respect to NAFTA. So digital commerce, I mean e-commerce, is now incorporated as a chapter environment and anti-corruption. Obviously, I mean, uh, John mentioned uh, something really relevant that uh, uh, when you think about Mexico, you think about uh, drug trafficking and that stuff, and probably one uh, uh, other uh, uh, condition uh, in which we are uh, mostly located, it's, and it's corruption. So basically, uh, having anti-corruption policies in the treaty is really good. We have also a, a, a domestic legal uh, framework with respect to anti-corruption really, really, really tough. So. Uh, these are good things for you uh, in order to consider investment. Uh, compliance mechanism, uh, there, there, there are, I mean, certain dispute settlement mechanisms uh, strengthened during, uh, I mean, within USMCA in order to protect investments. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, with, with respect to a strategic vision of supply, I mean, uh, the, the uh, and I will try not to go uh, uh, through these uh, a specific uh, list of items. I will try to expose you uh, quickly uh, why um, Mexican market is really uh, uh, interesting uh, for, for, for foreign uh, investors. I mean, uh, clearly we are uh, located in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in a certain region of the world which is uh, which is strategically. Uh, uh, close to the US obviously and, and, and uh, Canada and that gives us a, a, I mean an opportunity obviously uh, to have a better uh, I mean to be to be located as a better uh, a better position to, to, to locate certain industries. Uh, I mean in the northern part of the country uh, we have maquiladoras maquiladoras as you may be aware basically uh, consist on importing uh, on temporary basis certain uh, raw materials in order to manufacture products in Mexico without or exempting uh, the payment of general importer, import duties. And, and, and this gives the benefit of uh, foreign investors, I mean, to construct facilities in Mexico, manufacture with a cheap labor, and then export to, to the US and, or, or, other, or, or other worlds. Uh, so basically, it, that, that's one kind of operation that, that, that certainly, I mean, uh, will be uh, uh, interest, uh, interesting for you to know. And USMCA as well uh, uh, is, is not, I mean, distant to this operation because basically what uh, the USMCA will uh, grant or will give is uh, certainty with respect to the legal framework and uncertainty with respect to qualifying uh, uh, for certain origin in order to use preferential duty treatment upon the importation to the US or Canada. So basically, uh, with respect to, 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 to this new agreement changes, the rules of foreign requirements for the manufacturing industry, mainly for some industries, especially important for Mexico, like automotive, textile, and electronic, as I mentioned, 
uh, had suffered uh, certain changes that need to be carefully reviewed. But for you to, I mean, that you probably do not have right now an investment in Mexico, uh, what will be important for you to know is that we have uh, huge programs and we are uh, designed obviously to, 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 uh, to engage with foreign investors and, and, and construct facilities whereby manufacturing processes of a lot of industries are, are, are being conducted here in Mexico. Can you go to the next slide, please? I'm just going uh, to go now, Eduardo, if that's okay, please. Just to keep the time, thank you. Say again, sorry, Sarah. Uh, just, a, just a minute to run, if that's okay, Eduardo. Yeah, that's okay, that's, that's okay. okay, that's perfect. Thanks, my friend. Uh, the, the main, the Mexico benefits, I mean, um, uh, we'll, we'll, with USMCOA basically, and, and, and with this, I probably will end my presentation, will allow more companies to participate in export activity, strengthen its position as an export platform, and improve their participation in regional value contents, a regional value chain, sorry, with respect to regional value content, which is really important to comply with uh, rules of origin under uh, USMCA, and, and, and was the same case for NAFTA. Can you go to the next slide, please? This is, uh, uh, these are uh, some foreign capitalized companies uh, uh, to give you an idea of uh, the type of companies that we, I mean, there are much more uh, uh, others, I mean, established here in Mexico, but, but some of uh, the ones that we located as, as probably uh, someone relevant, some, some relevance that will be important for you to know that are established in Mexico are these ones. Can you go to the next slide, please? That will be, it. thank you very much for listening us. Uh, obviously, we are open to, to any consultation in case you need further information. This is just a huge, huge reference of what we are seeing now with NAFTA and USMC. Thank you so much, Eduardo. Fantastic information and advice uh, on, on what is quite a complex uh, situation with the new US-Mexico-Canada agreement coming into force, but some really good advice uh, from you and your colleagues. So thank you very much for that. That's brilliant. So we'd now like to uh, hand over to Diana Leon, who's our colleague who heads the infrastructure and financial services sector to, within DIT Mexico. Diana's going to cover some of the big projects and the developments that have happened in light of COVID-19 in Mexico. So let me hand over to Diana now. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. Um, well, if uh, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, the infrastructure sector in Latin America, I think, is very interesting in that it has long required to have a lot more activity and a lot more investment uh, than it's had uh, in order to be able to uh, really bolster economic activity and competitiveness. And uh, maybe some previous efforts have fallen short of that mark. But um, I want to share with you this a study that was published last year by the Inter-American Development Bank that uh, shows that the governments of Latin America would need to invest about 5% of their GDP each year into infrastructure projects so that they would be able to bridge the gap with more advanced economies, when the reality is that uh, over the past 20 years, they've invested about half of that. And what is more is that uh, this will uh, have a repercussion or a clear repercussion on uh, the uh, GDP growth of a lot of these countries. And uh, the cost will keep increasing uh, if um, further changes are not made over the next 10 years. So some of these governments uh, are aware of the situation and they've actually committed to launch programs that can improve the quality, the scope and the coverage of infrastructure uh, in their country uh, and use it as a detonator of economic development. And Mexico is not the exception. Since um, 2007, uh, uh, the first national infrastructure program was launched in an aim to increase competitiveness. And uh, at the time, the view was to make Mexico a bit of a logistics hub, um, uh, taking advantage of its geographic location. Um, so there were a number of, of uh, projects uh, that were uh, high profile that were completed and uh, some interesting uh, uh, changes that were enacted, such as the creation of a national infrastructure fund within uh, the uh, National uh, Bank of Public Works and uh, also the approval of a PPP law. Uh, it was a financing scheme that started being used at the beginning of uh, the 2000s uh, and it uh, was approved um, as, a, as a PPP law that would give a little bit more certainty uh, for a number of projects that were being uh, developed under that scheme, uh, particularly in the health sector. 
Uh, this was followed in the next administration in uh, 2014 for, by another national infrastructure plan uh, that had uh, covered a number of milestones, uh, most notably possibly the expansion of the port of Veracruz, uh, which is one of the most important ports in Mexico. And it initiated, but it didn't complete uh, a number of, of projects, which uh, are currently still ongoing and uh, are expected to be completed in this administration. Uh, for example, line three of the Guadalajara light train and uh, the Mexico Toluca passenger train. And uh, this administration, well, uh, one of the most recent developments is that in November of last year, it announced uh, that in partnership with the private sector, uh, it, it, this uh, national agreement for investment in infrastructure, it uh, includes a portfolio of about 147 projects uh, worth an investment of about 33 billion pounds. Uh, and it's seen as a forerunner to what will be a more uh, robust uh, and firm uh, national infrastructure program to be launched uh, later. Uh, next slide, please. So what's happened around uh, the um, COVID situation and its impact on these projects? Um, it's important to point out that even before this happened, uh, the Mexican government was looking at a number of these infrastructure projects as a way to underpin economic activity and to um, generate further employment. So uh, it was interesting to see that at, at, in the very early stages, uh, as we were um, getting into the contingency, uh, the government uh, was uh, very steadfast in uh, expressing its commitment to take some of these projects forward. So what did it do? Uh, at the beginning of April, uh, it announced that it had earmarked a substantial amount of money uh, for some of these flagship projects for this year and next year. Um, also that companies that were in the steel sector, in the cement sector, the glass sectors that had ongoing contracts with these projects would be allowed to continue under um, ex an exceptional um, situation. And uh, what is interesting is that, is that um, the uh, tendering process and the contracting process for some of these projects, such as the Tren Maya, um, has actually been uh, 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 happening uh, with, 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 a, with a lot of uh, uh, rapidity over the past uh, couple of months. So I think just, just to say that um, both in Mexico and other parts of the world, uh, they're beginning to look at uh, infrastructure projects as a way to underpin uh, economic development and to try to jumpstart um, the activity that has been affected by the situation. Next slide, please. So I've tried, uh, I, know, I know that we have limited time, but I've just tried to uh, highlight three projects that are seen as the highlight projects of this administration and to provide some very general um, uh, information about the description of these projects, what sort of UK content or involvement we've had, if any, and some of the latest developments. So. The first one is around the Tren Maya. It's uh, definitely one of the most ambitious uh, railways projects that we've seen uh, in uh, recent generations, um, considering that passenger trains were pretty much uh, abandoned uh, in, in, in the 90s, and they, they've slowly tried to recuperate on that as a, as a vile means of, of transportation. So this project, it's uh, quite sizable. It's very ambitious. It encompasses uh, both the refurbishment and the construction of about uh, 1,500 kilometers of um, passenger and cargo rail uh, that will service five states in the southeast, which is widely seen as one of the most uh, underserved um, areas of the, of the country. Uh, it will have um, 18 stations and uh, the idea is to develop 18 uh, nodes around it. Um, and um, it's uh, actually uh, probably seen as one of the uh, uh, favorite projects of the current administration. We already have instances of UK involvement, so a UK transport consultancy STEER that's been in Mexico for uh, over a decade now, uh, conducted some of the pre-feasibility and the demand studies for this. Uh, also a UK legal firm, uh, formerly Cameron McKenna, uh, CMS, was awarded a contract last year to provide legal advisory services for the project. And uh, to try to highlight uh, UK capabilities, we actually brought uh, the first uh, rail focused mission uh, of UK companies uh, to Mexico uh, in the past eight years. So we engaged with a number of these uh, uh, stakeholders, including Fonatur, who is currently heading uh, this, this project. And uh, in line with what I mentioned about the latest developments, uh, there's been um, a number of contracts that have been awarded for the construction of um, four out of the seven segments into which this line will be divided. So uh, it's been given to, uh, I think, a, a mix of different consortia. Uh, the first one was uh, a consortia formed by a Portuguese company uh, and a Chinese company, uh, Mota and Hill and China Communications. Uh, the second one to uh, a SIXA, a Mexican 
Mexican uh, contractor uh, in partnership with FCC, a Spanish company. And uh, the other two were given uh, uh, to uh, a mix of, of consortia from um, based in Mexico. Um, next slide, please. In the case of um, airports, uh, we uh, have had the situation of having a very uh, saturated airport in Mexico City for a number of years. And uh, a number of uh, different options have been um, evaluated. Um, the current administration is favoring uh, what they see as a three-pronged approach, um, basically to try to entertain a multi-airport scheme. Uh, and uh, this encompasses a number of, of interventions. So one of them is to try to modernize the existing Mexico City International Airport uh, and trying to invest in uh, a number of uh, refurbishment works, um, new boarding gates, even a new terminal uh, that is geared towards not so much maximizing capacity because it's pretty much already at capacity or, or very uh, near to that, but uh, to service about um, five, uh, um, 50 million uh, passengers per year. Um, and, uh, in comp uh, and, and as a complement to that, they're also trying to uh, refurbish um, Toluca International Airport about an hour away, uh, which is currently severely underutilized. And the idea is to try to redirect some of the traffic uh, over to that airport and to eventually reach a capacity of 20 million passengers per year. And uh, finally, uh, there's uh, a considerable work that is happening with what was formerly a military air base, um, Santa Lucia, uh, that is being repurposed for civilian use. Uh, there's an investment of uh, almost 3 billion um, pounds. Uh, construction began uh, in October of last year. It has two runways uh, that aims to uh, eventually uh, serve uh, uh, almost 20 million passengers on the first stage. Uh, and uh, it's already uh, be continuing uh, construction quite a bit. Uh, they, they've reported an advance of around 18% uh, and uh, ha have highlighted uh, the, the number of jobs that it has generated. Um, we've uh, followed this uh, project um, quite closely and we've been bringing um, bespoke missions on airports and aviation security for the past uh, six years almost. Uh, the latest one being in November. And uh, we've tried to introduce some UK stakeholders to um, these key players. It's important to note that uh, a number of, of UK companies are already involved in one capacity or another. Uh, just to mention in the security side, um, there's a number of UK companies that are already quite well known. Um, and uh, also uh, in the construction and the steel sector, there's also um, some content already. Next slide, please. Um, finally, the um, Tren Transismico, the Transismic Railway. Um, again, this is uh, a project that has also um, been uh, on the back burner uh, of, of many, many previous administrations. Uh, and what it aims is to refurbish around uh, 300 kilometers of rail line uh, from, primarily for cargo purposes, uh, divided into different sections that will connect the uh, port of Coatzacoalcos along the Gulf of Mexico with uh, the port uh, of Salina Cruz uh, in the Pacific Ocean, and to try to use this as a way to uh, incentivize the transportation of, of cargo, particularly containers uh, that go from Asia um, through to Europe and the US. Um, it, it's, it's interesting in that uh, the UK content that we had is pretty much historical. It hasn't been recent at all. Uh, there was uh, uh, there was a uh, British engineer, Whitman Pearson, that at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, uh, was engaged in the refurbishment of the rail line uh, in, in 1907. Um, and uh, we also have it very much in mind. We uh, included a uh, uh, meeting with some of the project stakeholders uh, in the mission that we had in July of last year. Um, and uh, we're trying to assess in what other ways uh, we can find other collaboration opportunities. Uh, it's, it's also had a lot of activity uh, at the beginning of the year where a number of works for uh, the refurbishment of, of the rail lines, the sleepers, uh, the bridges and the signaling have been given to a number of, of uh, contracting firms, uh, the majority Mexican, but one Spanish as well. Um, next slide, please. So um, this is just a taste and it's just uh, a, 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 a tiny portion of these uh, projects that are being um, touted by the current administration. Uh, they're all at different stages of development, but we've encountered in the conversations that we've had a number of um, potential collaboration opportunities. Some are, are already happening and some uh, we're further exploring. 
And uh, here is a, a, a list that is uh, by no way comprehensive, um, but includes some of the areas of collaboration that we've uh, identified. So this includes uh, throughout both the rail and airport sector, um, project and cost management, a number of consultancy services to see uh, feasibility uh, demand. Uh, also trying to assess uh, what financing schemes and operations are there. Uh, their uh, ambition of these projects is quite a bit. Uh, and uh, there will come a time where I think that they will need to look at other financing options to uh, make these projects a reality. Um, design engineering, um, even in the security side, security systems, I think uh, are very well positioned uh, in this market and there's uh, room to do a lot more. Um, signaling uh, and air side operations, uh, a number of areas are along the supply chain. And one thing that we've been trying to do in this uh, pause that has been imposed by the contingency is to put together a UK capabilities directory, um, both for airports and railways, to try to share it at the highest level with some of these project stakeholders. So if there's an interest uh, in being included uh, or considered for these directories, uh, let us know and we'll be more than happy to, uh, to be in touch and, and to tell you the information that we would need from, from interested companies. Um, so I, I know that we're almost um, running out of time. So um, next slide, um, there you have my um, contact information. And uh, if you need any uh, further updates about these projects or any other projects, please let us know. Fantastic. Thank you, Diana. Thank you very much. There's huge amounts of information there for you. And um, we really appreciate all the time you've taken to, to put those presentations together. And likewise to, to John and Eduardo and your team for putting the presentations together. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come in. And just perhaps starting with, with you, Diana, um, just really want to get a sense that with COVID-19, we know that businesses both here and in, in Mexico are starting to, to open up. And are you sensing that there's um, a lot of keenness and uh, confidence in, in opening up gradually as in Mexico itself? Um, yes, what I, I've been able to see, at least in, in some of these uh, sectors, particularly the construction sector, um, um, John Wright mentioned that it's uh, probably one of the sectors that will be uh, hit the hardest. And I think uh, um, maybe it was a sector that was already um, ailing from uh, a lack of activity beforehand. But I, I do think that they're really looking at uh, trying to bolster activity in, the, in this sector, in the infrastructure sector, as a way to... Uh, 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 try to gain momentum and 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 try to uh, kickstart what was has been uh, a, 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 a dormant uh, 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 work in in in, in the past uh, uh, probably mm -hmm. uh, year or so. So I think uh, that there's definitely I think an appetite to see what else can be done uh, to go beyond uh, even this flagship projects to see uh, what other projects can be developed uh, in the uh, at the state level at the municipal level as well. And uh, there's definitely I think a lot of appetite to see what the uh, experience of the UK has been in, in a number of areas. I think uh, um, we, we've been speaking a lot about some of the planning methodologies that are used in the UK, uh, such as uh, BIM, uh, the five case model, and uh, the, in the, there's an appetite to see uh, what uh, lessons learned there are from the UK that maybe can be used in the, in the Mexican arena. Certainly, and I like the sound of the UK capabilities uh, brochure that you mentioned. That sounds that sounds great. John, would you add anything to that? And have you picked up increasing sort of confidence as as we emerge from this difficult situation, COVID nineteen? Yeah, certainly. I mean, it's like um, racing horses at the line, isn't it? People are so desperate to you know move forwards and get things going again, and. You know, as I mentioned in my presentation, we think it's a, a very good time and we would like to encourage people to do so. But I think there's a massive pent up energy and uh, demand for activity there, which we can all benefit from. Yeah, definitely. Um, Eduardo, I can see you, you've answered a question. Somebody answered, but I'll, I'll um, go over the question that someone referred to. What, what, it's quite a big question. What kind of legal advice would you need to enter Mexico? You probably need another, <laughs> another webinar to do that, I think. So you're on mute there, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that's correct, Sarah. But I mean, it, it's a good question. Obviously, I mean, it will depend on the type of activity you, you, you intend to develop in Mexico. You will only want to trade, I mean, products with, without, I mean, incorporating actually an entity in Mexico. Well, it will be simple. Just you need to find the, the key partner to conduct the importation and, and, and help you with the distribution in Mexico. That will take us, obviously, to incorporate 
a number of corporate issues that need to be reviewed, as well as, I mean, if you, there's trademark, trademarks involved, you need to, to conduct the mm -hmm. registrations. And, and there are, I mean, certain uh, regulatory aspects that need to be occurred. I, I don't know if we're taking, uh, I mean, talking about merchandises or, or, or uh, I mean, uh, probably will be different products and, and uh, or not actually products, you know, probably what you intend to trade with Mexico are not products uh, and, and are uh, basically other type of, of, of investment. So, I mean, it will depend. It's a huge, huge question and, and it yeah. needs to be addressed case by case. Yeah, we've seen an increasing interest with uh, British software companies and services as well. It's obviously a key element of, of the work that needs legal support as well. But, uh, there's a, a comment from uh, from Chris Black, who's referring to supply chains, uh, and he's quite rightly commenting that with difficulties in Asia, um, we're seeing and expecting more demand from Mexico and the wider North American markets in, in terms of local autom automotive supplies and um, demand for components and parts, which I think is true, isn't it? We've seen evidence of some companies such as Jeep, I think, and Mazda moving more of their production into to Mexico as a result of uh, COVID-19 and the challenges that that's presented in China and, and Asia. I think that will be a pattern we see growing as well. Um, Andy, did you have uh -huh. any questions from your companies? Um. Well, the one that you just referred to, Zainab, is one of our uh, West Midlands companies, but we haven't had, had any flagged in advance, really, no. But uh, I could just share one bit of information that uh, the audience might be interested in, which is that we've just um, agreed to do a joint uh, webinar on automotive opportunities in, in Mexico with Santander and SMMT and, and DIT, both in Mexico and, and UK. Um, provisionally scheduled for the 22nd of um, July, uh, but to be confirmed. But if, if people are interested in that, if they talk to their international trade advisor, they'll be able to give them uh, details in uh, probably in a couple of weeks time. Fantastic, thank you. And uh, we've got another a question just come in about the energy sector, the all important oil and gas sector. Um, how do we see the energy sector and the Pemex budget for the coming year? Uh, and is there any news about whether the refinery is going to, to go ahead? Eduardo, do you have any comments? Yeah, on that? I would tell that the refinery is going, is going ahead. Uh, basically, these, these, uh, I mean, the Mexican president has, has put a lot of pressure to continue with this kind of infrastructure price, such as this one. Uh, uh, do we expect, I mean, that the budget the, I mean, Pemex budget will, will grow. I, I don't know. I mean, they're struggling a lot with trying, I mean, trying saving uh, Pemex. I don't know, John, if you have any any information such as this one, but we, we, we are seeing, I mean, uh, Pemex uh, 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 being invested uh, a lot of money by the government, uh, even though, I mean, uh, certain uh, qualificators such as Moody's and, and, and a number of, of these ones, I mean, have announced that the I mean, it has, uh, I mean, huge losses, but I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Summer as well. Go ahead, John. No, I don't have anything more to add. I think Eduardo summarized that situation mm. very well indeed, yeah. Excellent. Okay. Well, I think we'll wrap up there, everybody. If, uh, thank you so much to John Wright Lobbies Consultancy. Eduardo Soleta from Sanchez Devani, so tell us, sorry, and all your colleagues. And uh, Diana Leon uh, from DIT Mexico, all our DIT Mexico colleagues, and the Mexico UK Business Council. Um, thanks to Midlands Engine for partnering us today as well. It's been fantastic working with Midlands Engine, and thank you for all your attention. I'll hand over to my colleague Mark on the events team now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tara, and thank you to all the speakers today. Um, if you could please, uh, if you'd like to uh, see any more of these webinars, if you go onto the Business West website and you can follow any of the social media that's on the page at the moment. But before you go, if you could take a minute just to fill out the short poll on your screen, it'd be very much appreciated. And from Business West and Midlands Engine, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>